It has been a, a labor of love. I, Richard, I think, would agree that it hasn't always been fun. Um, but it, that's actually been quite an adventure. Um, I wanted to say before I even get going, if you'll allow me, um, that um, uh, these projects, I, this show I'm doing today, this week, and I've got all kinds of thanks and congratulations and all kinds of, uh, of recognition for which I'm very, very grateful. It has been really a labor of love. But in fact, I, it's always good to remind uh, our, our goers what complex undertakings these things really, really are. I, for one, actually, as you will probably discover the lecture, that I'm not really an Italian Renaissance um, a specialist, which is the biggest part of the subject, although I worked on the, the nude in France for many years, and it's something that's long interested in me. Um, and if you've been up in the exhibition, you notice we have a kind of particular way of presenting the material. We have these small groups of themes, an incredible range of themes, the body of Christ, St. Sebastian, Venus, uh, the nude in the landscape. And the way we put the show together was, uh, it started actually when I was chief curator. There was, a, I had a couple of research assistants, both PhD candidates, um, Andrea Herrera and Thomas Di Pasquale, who worked with me to kind of figure out uh, first place, what we could recently hope to borrow, and how to put together these groups that had told a story. And we really tried hard to give some kind of a coherent narrative upstairs. Um, so I read her actually began with me five years ago. She's put in five years of her life on these shows, and she's played a very significant role. Tom Lee was probably started five years ago. He wasn't always with the program, but he's, very, he's contributed significantly. At some point when we started doing the catalog, we brought in two of the great scholars of the Italian Renaissance New, Stephen Campbell and Jill Burke, uh, who are co-editors of the catalog with me, and they've been indispensable. Um, our curator of paintings, which I can unfortunately say that I played a role in the highway, Dominic Gasparotto, um, arrived just, just about the time we started working on this. He was involved also from the beginning in helping us shape this kind of narration, the choice of objects. Eventually, he was involved in helping us negotiate objects, and he's been a valued advisor throughout the process, and I'm very grateful to him as well. Annalise Dumas, the curator of sculpture, Beth Morrison, um, Julian Brooks, most of the curators of the Getty, the, the lead curators of the Getty, have really helped us bring this together. And Richard himself, I have to say, has played an important role in helping us secure key loans, so I love doing the show, but I hardly did it by myself. There was an extraordinary group of people who made that happen. I'm also pleased to say that uh, a group of friends of the Getty, long-standing friends of the Getty, who understand what we're trying to do with our exhibitions, really, really make these things happen and be exciting, who, who um, have contributed to that. Um, uh, one of them is actually here today, uh, Suzanne Dill Booth, an old friend, a great friend of the Getty and the artistic community in Los Angeles, I should say, and in Austin and elsewhere, and, and it's, it's great that you're here, and, uh, and I want to thank you all for, for that. So, the new, <laughs> the vibrant, naturalistic, often sensual new, is one of the great innovations of, the, of Renaissance art, and in fact, of the Renaissance more broadly. By 1530, which is the end date of the exhibition, the role of the new in art making had risen to such preeminence uh, within, within uh, European art uh, that it virtually transformed it. This talk basically, and the exhibition, concerns the pathway to that success and the often contentious social environment uh, in which this, what is essentially a revolution, played out. Closely linked to the revival of the classical values that gives Renaissance, which is the French term for rebirth, uh, its name, the notion of the nude came to encompass much more than the beautiful human body. It carries with it a range of notions bound up with the very idea of being human, including human subjectivity and man's perfectibility. It was, I think really deserves to be seen, as a metaphor for the fullness of human potential that the Renaissance, going back to the ideas of ancient Greek philosophers, sought to encourage. It was the moment when artists themselves began to develop a greater sense of their place in the larger social order and of the power of creativity. Indeed, metaphors of creativity become more interesting complex and complex in this era, and they too are bound up with the human body, excuse me, with the human body and its representation. And I'll talk a little bit further about this um, later on. 
Finally, one associates notions of timelessness with the great masterpieces of Renaissance art in a way that Renaissance artists themselves did with regard to classical artists and the great masterpieces of folks like Phidias, Polyclitus, and Lysippus. Although it must be said that they weren't all, few of those works survived and they weren't always sure which they were. Um, and for the Renaissance, one thinks of Donatello, Michelangelo's sculptures of David, you see here on the left, um, or the Sistine ceiling, Giorgione and Titian's painting of their climbing Venus, one of the most iconic paintings of nude, of nude or Albrecht Durer's engraving of Adam and Eve. These works not only feel timeless to many today, but they seem to occupy a higher moral plane due to the sheer perfection of their artistry. But, as, and that's actually not an accident, um, but as often the case when one aspires to perfection, thinks in the abstract, or simply tries to occupy a higher moral ground, things can quickly get messy. Often, if you simply look behind the veil of timelessness, or temporality, that is to say, time itself, rears its voracious head. In part, the point of the current exhibition, the Renaissance Nude, was to survey the sheer brilliance of the European achievement in representing the nude between 1400 and 1530, to assemble such, again, timeless masterpieces as the Durer of Adam and Eve, which is in the show, or Paul Eroy's staggeringly influential um, Battle of the Naked Man, or Michelangelo's breathtaking drawing of the labors of Hercules. This is indeed one of the great moments in the history of art, and the new is one of the Renaissance's towering innovations. But the exhibition argues that the story becomes even more compelling and human if one situates its more closely back in uh, its own time and culture, uh, looking at the facts on the ground, as it were, to not only get a closer glimpse of what the artists had in their minds, but also how the art was perceived by its own culture and society, which is pretty interesting. So if you walk through the exhibition with a friend or family member this afternoon, you may find that your responses are sometimes similar that is often different from one another. Folks respond to art in different ways. Uh, but they also respond to the new in particularly different ways. This lecture is about the range of those responses and about the gap that sometimes exists between the ideal and reality, between intention and reception, between what the artist strove for and what his viewer actually experienced. In short, it is about the difference in response between one viewer and another, and even the conflict between the classically inspired humanist culture and its Christian society, with the society within which it emerged. And finally, it is about the struggle of the new to find a comfortable place within this larger Christian culture. Our own culture today is still, is still extensively Judeo-Christian, um, and so not surprisingly, some of the responses to the dude then may not sound familiar. They're not often different from those we hear today. So, in order to understand what the new, uh, what the new, how the new art ran into trouble, let us start uh, with some of its ideals and strivings as the intellectuals of that day actually articulated them. And here I'm talking primarily about the values developed in Italy within humanist culture, and primarily in the 15th century, but a little bit earlier than that as well. And so, for example, quite early in this period, um, in the period covered by the show, that is to say between 1411 and, 11, 14, 11 and 1413, a Greek humanist, Manuel Crisolaris, wrote a group of letters about art that would end up having a big influence throughout Italy. Uh, he wrote about taking, he was talking about undressed figures in art. The beauties of painting and statues are not an unworthy thing to behold. Rather, do they indicate a certain nobility and the intellect that admires them? It is looking at the beauties of women that is licentious and base. What is the reason for this? It is that we admire not so much the beauties of the bodies and 
statues and paintings as the beauty and mind of their maker. So there are a number of things going on here. Totally naked bodies, especially the opposite sex, is acknowledged as improper. But also the creative process, especially that around the representation of the human body, is starting to be seen as more than just a manual craft, but having a rational intellectual component. It is an act of intellect as much as a craft, and we'll actually see later on exactly what that means. And as such, the appreciation of art works reflects the discernment and intellectual sophistication of the beholder in grasping the intellect that an artist had put into the work. Given the extremely rarefied circles in which artists and art, such art was produced, what we might regard as uh, the elitism or snobbery of this reasoning is hardly surprising. So, moreover, this notion about the important qualities the artist brings to the table is developed in interesting ways. Uh, the 15th century, initially in Italy, developed theories of proportion for the representation of ideal lives. <coughs> These concepts were based on classical texts that drew upon mathematical principles, principles that were viewed as inherently rational. Thus, the very procedures for depicting the unclosed body were, uh, enabled the viewer to enjoy the beauty of the nude in a way that did not leave them subject to inappropriate impulses or responses. While this sort of high-mindedness high -minded, may in fact seem a bit precious or even specious today, it gained wide enough currency to see both the close study of the undressed body moved to the center of artistic training during the second half of the 1400s, first in Italy, and by the 16th century, the depiction of the nude itself would move to a central role in art that was being produced across Europe. And so this is really a show about the kind of origins. And actually, we, we, we organize the show thematically, so it may not always be quite so obvious, but it is something that unfolded, especially at the beginning, relatively slowly over the first decades of the 15th century, gradually gaining speed. So another part of the analytical artistic process concerned learning and understanding the body by drawing it over and over again. So on your left, the Filipino Lippi drawing is one of more than 100 such drawings from life that we know the artist made. Those are just the ones they made in the workshop. Those are just the ones that survived. We know there must have been many more. And they're most often not studies for a particular work of art, although that certainly was possible, but simply done in order to understand the body how its component parts, bone, muscle, flesh, work together along with gesture and movement. The goal was to understand the body so well that one could then create convincing poses truly from knowledge absorbed largely in the workshop by doing, and from the study of ancient models copied in a similar way. So for example, the Parmigianino drawing there in the center um, is a study for St. Jerome, the famous painting of the Vision of St. Jerome in London, it was actually one of a half a dozen such studies just of the pose of St. Jerome lying back on the ground like that. Um, and he was simply sorting out how to get that pose right. He may not necessarily have had a model in that pose, but he studied the bodies so long enough that he could start to begin to try to work that out. And as I say, it took about half a dozen drawings to do that, and only toward the end did he actually then add the, in, in the painting the figure has a little drapery over him and then he only added that in the end. So he literally worked from the new body to, to figure out how to display the limbs, how to, how to develop the pose. So all understanding of an, uh, um, so basically the artist is displaying all of his understanding of anatomy that again he developed from, from the, working from the live model and also from uh, antique sculpture. In this case, some of you may recognize actually that the pose, pose has an echo of the great Laocoon sculpture, which had only been discovered, excavated, discovered in Rome 20 years beforehand. Uh, in a similar way, Leonardo's remarkable anatomical drawing on the right, the upper right, is itself a kind of reduction, not necessarily a verbatim, a verbatim transcription of the single dissection, which itself was usually messy and kind of ugly, but a synthesis of what the artist had learned about the body 
about body muscle uh, and the rest of the body parts from the dissections that he studied in the morgue. A sophisticated methodology supports Manuel Pizzolaris' earlier contention that one can that what one, one can and should enjoy about the depiction of the nude is how much the artist himself actually brought to the table, studying, analyzing, and then synthesizing what he learned. Tied in to these interests in both human proportions and the ability to represent the body in accurately and in different poses, the variety of gestures, and always with an eye to the graceful, was the practice of the study of the nude after ancient sculpture. Um, the Parco Janino drawing, as I said, was one example that seems to reference the Laocoon, um, but Pisanello, shown in the lower right there, a rather pale but wonderful drawing, that already in the first half of the 15th century, he was a, from northeast Italy, but he went down to Rome simply to study uh, classical sculpture, make drawings after it. Some of you may recognize the river god on the right, who's still to be seen on the Capitol, Capitoline Hill. Um, and then nearly a century later, because things really started to accelerate after Pisanello, uh, the Netherlandish artist Gosar, um, on the upper right, uh, went with his humorous painter and then spent a year or more in Rome, mostly just drawing after the antique um, and learning about classical culture. And um, of course, you know, some of you will remember that the, great, the actual Spinario, that amazing bronze sculpture, was actually shown at the villa a few years ago. Um, also, during the Renaissance, um, humanist culture, central to humanist culture, which is essentially about the discovery, rediscovery of Greek, uh, classical texts, philosophy, literature, law, law, the full range of intellectual activity of antiquity was being rediscovered. Recently, they, they were literally going out to monasteries, going out to, to uh, secular libraries, locating on the shelves texts that had been overlooked and forgotten for centuries, editing them. Uh, trying to come up with authoritative editions. It's the beginning of a whole process of critical study of, of ancient texts, which still goes on today. And, human and the notion of, of humanism is the foundation of our term, the humanities, which of course uh, is so, so, so central to our uh, university uh, curricula. So there's a direct connection in all of this. But part of that was the study of classical art. That was integral to humanist endeavor. Um, and so, Humanists love acquiring these reduced copies of famous ancient sculptures. You see one up at the upper left, there's a little spinario in the show uh, uh, that's you know, handleable, handleable size. And actually, these humanists would keep them in their, in, their cap, in their sort of study cabinets. And when the group of intellectuals came over there and connoisseurs came over, they would pass them around, really handle these things and kind of live with them. So it, they were vehicles of knowledge. And on the uh, Bottom left is the great Apollo of Belvedere. This is a sculpture, it's actually a life-size sculpture discovered, I think it was in 1489. So literally, major ancient sculpture was being rediscovered and excavated while this whole outlook was uh, being developed. And a particular sculpture, Antico, well represented in the exhibition, um, would create, produce these reduced versions, these, if you like, cabinet-sized versions. Almost always these sculptures were were fragmentary, an arm was missing, a leg was missing, sometimes more. And Tico would restore them to the way he thought they would have looked, as he's done here with the Apollo Belvedere, and then cast them in multiple copies where they became incredibly uh, widely sought after. So, so ultimately, these works were not only studied for their beauty, but ultimately they became the sources of works of art. And, uh, and I line these people up because the Adam and the um, Durer's Adam was probably based on the study of more than one classical model, but by the Apollo Belvedere has been suggested that sort of in the contrapost of Hammond of the most musculature as one of the possible sources that would have been an inspiration for them. So a little bit of a way in which these uh, works quickly began to inform how artists created um, new works of art. So, in fact, so as my colleague Davide Gasparotto has written so eloquently in the exhibition catalog, classical statues were increasingly seen themselves as the benchmarks of perfection and ideal beauty that this new generation of Renaissance artists sought to capture in their own works. So, 
Renaissance artists left little to chance in the representation of the human body as a result of these elaborately theorized new workshop practices. The process itself was ambitious and complex. The skill set required highly refined and demanding, and the foundation is steeped in a close and dis disciplined investigation of both real bodies and the body as shown in the finest works of art handed down over millennia. Finally, I want further uh, rationale for the depiction of the uh, new figure, which I place on the more amusing category, uh, is that it, it contributes a quality of timelessness to the artwork. So this idea was already inherent, was already out there in the Renaissance. In a text completed in 1462 at the Ferrari's Court, a center of humanism then, Angelo, Angelo de Cembrio attributes the following observation to one Leonello, who was presumably his actual patron, Leonello d'Este de Marchesa of Ferrara. In the case of cast or marble statues, one finds that the best statues are wholly or partially nude. They are best judged in the state of nakedness, for it is not every fashion of clothing that pleases every subsequent generation and race. Some kinds of shoes and cloaks and belts and even armor become ridiculous, even in paintings. Think of bell lines, let's say. <laughs> uh, but the artifice of nature is supreme. No period fashion changes it. So a very pragmatic uh, uh, argument in favor of timelessness so here, um, the Cembrio Leonello also alluded to a principle of artistic uh, achievement just mentioned, the new faith in the study and depiction of works after nature truthfully. While these are far from the only new principles articulated in this arena, elaborately formulated ideas of beauty also turn on the depiction of the naked body. Suffice it to note that a lofty and sophisticated um, set of standards were, were being articulated for judging artistic achievement. These standards are all conceived with the human body as the focus of art making. So let's start in a familiar place, the Sistine ceiling of Michelangelo. First and foremost, a sculptor, Michelangelo consciously modeled his celebrated works uh, on the antique, depicting in marble subjects such as Bacchus, Apollo and Cupid. Yet beyond the learned humanist circles in which Michelangelo was nurtured, and even within it, his greatest commissions were going to be in Christian art. A profoundly religious man, he was deeply engaged throughout his career with the depiction of the new body of Christ as the man of sorrows, and of other biblical figures such as the iconic Marvel of David that we saw earlier. And along with Christian humanists and the clerics within his circle, he believed in the beautiful body as an emblem of human virtue and perfectibility. This approach deployed individual motifs, conventions, and principles of ancient art to heighten both the narrative expressions and expressiveness and the spiritual import of Christian imagery. At the same time, he placed the body, which is most often the heroic nude male body, in the uh, which was conceived, he conceived always in the manner of classical art, at the center of his endeavor to, in the words of one scholar, we called it reform Christian art. So Michelangelo really wanted to marry classical culture with Christianity, and he was a man in that sense of uh, very deep faith. So the um, ceiling, the Sistine ceiling, basically represents scenes from the book of Genesis, starting with the creation of the world to the drunkenness of Noah. And then the right is probably the most famous of those scenes, this extraordinary conception of the creation of man, with God on the right and Adam being fashioned from his gesture on the left. The epic frescoes of the Sistine ceiling, judged even in their day as revolutionary, express a triumphal, sensual biblical narrative. But in doing so, the artist places the profane in the surface of the, of the sacred. Not only did he depict Adam, Eve, Hammond, Noah, and other figures as heroically nude, but he went quite a bit further and supplemented the large, familiar biblical iconography with a range of figures called ignudi, a suite of 20 muscular naked youths based in part on another 
Grecian excavated masterpiece, that classical fragment known as the Belvedere Torso, which you see on the right. And as one scholar pointed out, the artist, um, essentially a virtuoso display of invention, completes this fragment in 20 different ways. Essentially, this one sculpture was the source of his working out all of these ideas of these extraordinarily varied images of these new figures. And in that sense, Michelangelo is confirming the glory of the new golden age, which will be even greater than the golden age of antiquity. So an artistic goal as part of this whole thing, and we'll come back to this again, is um, artists didn't want to just meet the challenge of ancient art, they wanted to surpass it. And this is where things get particularly interesting, and we really are talking about a moment of change. For one, there's an account of uh, a visit by the connoisseur and collector Alfonso d'Este to see the ceiling in 1512, just after it was finished. He's climbing up on the ladder and spending quite a bit of time to take it in the piece. In fact, other people left, and he just hung around. He couldn't get enough of it. And he said, he wrote later, that uh, he couldn't get enough of looking at the figures, and he gave the artist many kind, uh, many kind words. And then he tried to hire him to create a painting for himself. Essentially, this is actually a moment that where um, we're looking at a different outlook towards art and possibilities of the nude, something to gaze at for pleasurable enjoyment, and appreciation of artist's view for its own sake is really beginning to take hold. So we're beginning to, the nude is central to this whole new attitude and outlook towards art, its function as a collectible, uh, as something to be lived with as part of the lives of secular people. At the same time, the Sistine ceiling did not have the same effect on everyone. As had proved so often to be the case by then, a cleric was among those to object to the ceiling. Vasari reports that Pope Adrian VI himself, this is now more than 10 years after the ceiling was finished, referred to the ceiling as a bath of news. And by which I think he meant also a bathroom of news, uh, and suggested that the work should be destroyed. Now, some people have, people, one always has to take Vasari with a grain of salt, um, and Vasari is writing about 30 years after the Pope. But that kind of comment is actually very credible within the context of art critical responses that the new was sort of experienced in the decade of the 20s, so, so it, it can't be dismissed out of hand. So, what is interesting here is that. The nudity, theoretically subsidiary figures in the overall scheme, have come to stand in for the whole in this wise work. And their iconographic boldness and unconventionality within a traditional biblical iconography have basically remained in the foreground, forefront of the discussions of the ceiling ever since then. It really is marking a sea change. In reality, Michelangelo was hardly the first artist to introduce sensuality into Christian subject matter. The very nature of private devotional practice, the central element of Christian worship throughout Europe by the 15th century, contributed, contributed to this problem, if, if somewhat inadvertently. And the wider development of devotional in, in, imagery itself may have also contributed to the emergence of the new as a focus in Renaissance art. That may seem at first Hearing a bit improbable, but um, I will try to explain here. So, starting as early as the 13th century, the Roman Catholic Church sought aggressively to engage the lay faithful in private prayer and meditation as a regular practice of their day. They actually tried to organize it. The truly devout, if they followed the church, the canonical day, would actually stop six or seven, eight or seven or eight times a day and briefly recite prayers for three or four minutes, just as, as, a, as an act of devotion, an act of piety, an act of Christian faith. Um, and the idea was to start enhancing the spiritual lives of the, of, the, of the laity and increase their piety. And this actually did take hold in quite an interesting way, fostered, and it also fostered, very interestingly, a number of forms of devotional art. It actually had a big impact on art making. It was so successful that over the centuries, uh, not only played, not only 
encouraged the devotional practice itself and strengthened it, but it also fostered a level of artistic production, which is quite extraordinary. And um, you'd be amazed at the number of Renaissance, late medieval Renaissance works you see in museums that belong to this tradition. So these included private prayer books, of which uh, one example is in the exhibition, which I'll show you on the right, which were tailored both textually and iconographically to the requirements of individual patron. These are you know, handmade books, they're one-offs, they're made for individuals. Uh, along with individual <coughs> devotional objects that depicted, say, the Virgin Mary or the body of Christ, such as both, let's say, at or following the crucifixion, in a sense, presented in a range of devotional context. So, so these are all this kind of, all of these things by this kind of private devotional image that you see on the screen. And all of these, I should say, are in the exhibition. So the Man of Sorrows uh, was a subject devised in this time to support the new devotional practices of private individuals and clerics. And on the left, the ex this extraordinary polychrome sculpture uh, of the Holy Trinity, this is, I think, I, mean, I think everything that shows amazing, but this is actually one of the most surprising works because it's from 1430, very early, painted on alabaster, and although it's been very carefully restored for the exhibition, because actually the curators are excited to see it here, um, the polychrome is largely original. The condition is quite extraordinary. Um, so much polychrome sculpture from this period has been lost because of the fragility of the surface, or it's been cleaned away because it couldn't be preserved adequately, and so we just have the sculptures. So we have to keep in mind that this is the way many people experience works of art. So it shows God the Father and an angel displaying for contemplation the body of the dead Christ. And it's by the southern German sculptor Hans Mulcher, court artist, uh, and actually he's an artist not very well known to Americans because I'm not sure even if there are other works in this country, but the major works all over Germany and well worth looking out for. Um, so by the early 15th century, we see artists striving to depict Christ not only as human, but as a palpable presence. And here, if you look closely at the body of Christ, oh, oh sorry, the wrong body. Oh my God, I'm going to give away my punchline. Sarah, uh, laser pointer here. By the way, I can, I can describe it. Um, well, the naked body of Christ um, is closely observed and rendered with ex exceptional sensitivity, detailing, for example, the rib cage, which I think you can see there pretty clearly, and the very softness of the flesh drawn